I'll just hit the go live button. You might see on your screen. There we go. I think it says we're live now. Can everybody see my screen? Got some, Heather, you see me? Good. Welcome everybody. This is our uh, third Wednesday of the month wildlife webinar. It's great to have you here. Um, I don't want to have too long of introductions. Let some people trickle in here. It's great to see the interests. People love trees. They want to know what's happening with their trees, especially when they start seeing their trees die or go into decline. And, and it really worries a lot of people because trees live so long and they just make such a big change in the environment. So um, I'm excited uh, this week to have Heather just talk with us. But we'll start with a few housekeeping items uh, as people trickle in. We are, this webinar is being live streamed and it's also going to be recorded. That recording will be available on our YouTube channel. This is the handle for our YouTube channel. You can search that. It's MD for Maryland Wildlife Management all together. Um, I'll have a link at the very end where you can go and use your phone to, to log into that and subscribe so you can follow us in the future. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, I'm monitoring the chat during the presentation. So I'll be collating and trying to answer what I can in the background and also just gathering your questions. I love to have like interactive stuff coming up. Heather, let me know if you'd like them um, kind of inserted questions. I can kind of pop up things or if you would like, I'll try to monitor the chat for you, but if you'd like to handle things during the presentation, that's totally fine too. Uh, yeah, if you wanna if you want to monitor and pop in, I'm happy great. to answer questions on the fly. Cool, great. So use that little chat button. That's what it looks like. That's your icon at the bottom. There's a little control panel in the middle of your Zoom screen. And you'll also get a brief survey at the end of when you log off. And please, please share your thoughts on that so we can help serve you better. Today, uh, again, excited to have Heather Harmon Disk presents about a forest health update. Uh, she is with the she's a forest health entomologist with the Maryland Department of Agriculture and the Forest Pest Management Department. Um, so she's going to take share with us all the recent pests and disease. This is our annual. We we have Heather come back every year in the fall to present to us on this topic because it's always changing. And they're doing annual surveys, and she's going to give us a great update on the state of the forest health issues facing us today. Um, next month, just telegraph us up, uh, put on your calendar for next, uh, I think it's November 15th, if I'm correct. Yeah, it's on the top, it's on the screen, November 15th. Bob Long, he is our Upland Game Bird Manager for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. He's going to be talking about research they're doing on wild turkey populations. Uh, here in Maryland. He is running a big study. He's got staff. They're putting GPS collars on turkeys, finding out where they're going. Are they surviving? How are they dying? And all sorts of other stuff in between. So you'll learn a lot about uh, wild turkeys next month. I'm going to be out on vacation. I might be able to pop out and run the meeting. I hope to be able to do that. If I can't, I'm going to have a substitute in my place. So um, hopefully I'll be here for that. But just to let you know, I might be I'm, on, I'm planning to be out on annual leave, but I'll try to jump out and do this if I can. Okay, last slide um, before we get going with Heather. Um, take a moment. Uh, we're we're realizing, uh, I've realized really the important importance of uh, social media in this new age. I really didn't want to deal with it for a long time, but it's just a way, to, it's such a powerful tool to reach people. If you watch YouTube, uh, you can use this little uh, QR code in the top left put your phone on camera mode and, and let it look at this QR code and it'll take you to our channel. You can hit subscribe right now. Uh, it helps to promote us, helps us to, to get good speakers, helps to let the speakers know that their content's getting out to the public and we can just reach an even wider audience. So I'm also on Twitter slash X. Um, I'm at Luke Rangewalker. I used to work in range management. So I had to play on Luke Skywalker. Um, one of my, a friend of mine came up with that idea for a handle a long time ago. So I kept it, a, I like, it gives people a chuckle. So uh, always posting different types of things happening in the natural resource world and wildlife conservation. Give me a follow. I love it. I'll follow you back and um, uh, we'll continue to get educational content about wildlife management out that way. So with that, I will pull, and that uh, QR code on the bottom right is how it will take you to my profile. So you can uh, see what you like. If you can scroll through my profile, if you like it, give me a follow. If not, uh, give me some thoughts on what you'd like to see more of. All right, I'm going to stop my share and let Heather take it away. All right. So let's get started. 
And by the way, Heather, we have 48 people on. This is just great. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, love to see the interest in this topic. All right. <clears throat> so hopefully everybody can see my title screen. Um, so I am the Forest Health Entomologist. I am also the Regional Entomologist for Forest Pest Management on the Eastern Shore. So here is our lovely Ken Narrows. <clears throat> um, you can see there is a forest. We were evaluating it for um, water damage. So um, that's kind of fun there. So let's go hop in. So the first topic we're going to talk about today is Emerald Ash Borer. So just as a quick overview, um, let me see if I can get my, there's my pointer. Um, so here is the adult of Emerald Ash Borer. Here are the galleries that they cause, we like to call these serpentine galleries or S-shaped galleries. You can see this uh, kind of shape through here. The adults, when they emerge from the trees, they create these D-shaped exit holes. Here you can see two adults emerging. And then while they're making these galleries, this is what uh, the larval stage will look like and then eventually causing the mortality of the tree. So uh, we've had emerald ash borer in Maryland since 2003. Uh, so it's not a new problem, but uh, we still consistently do activities to try to save some of our ash populations. And so uh, what have we been doing in the past year? So we've been setting up adult traps. Um, previously, both Wicomico and Worcester, we had not been able to pull a live beetle out of those counties, which now is uh, Wicomico um, in this trap right up here uh, was positive this year. So the populations, our traps are not extremely attractive, but um, attractive enough that we were able to collect some beetles out of here. Um, not that the beetles aren't in these two counties, but uh, we just hadn't been able to pull one out. So now Wicomico is positive, leaving just Worcester. Um, you can also see there's some additional um, adult traps around uh, the state, and those are at our parasitoid release locations. So um, sometimes, you know, like with the ordering of it all, um, so there's also adult traps here, and there's also parasitoid release locations here. Um, and so this year we released uh, parasitoids at uh, six different locations. So Western Maryland, the upper shore, and then the lower shore. And then in addition to trap, in addition to trapping and parasitoids releases, we also uh, were able to treat trees. And so these trees were treated in some of our state parks. And uh, so that's, um, they were here in again, the Northeast region. And then we had some down in uh, the lower shore. <clears throat> in addition to that, we had some wildland treatments which aren't represented on this map, but they, this is what they look like. Um, so a lot of these wildland areas that we're treating are, um, wet all year round. So you can see there's water laying here. A lot of times they'll start to flood. So you can see what we end up doing is we are treating trees to save some seed bank for the future, as well as to help uh, provide some erosion control. And so here we start treating these trees above the high tide line. And so we treat them um, with these high pressure units and we, inside of them, we put emamectin benzoate, this chemical here. So we are using triage G4. It is a um, less, uh, it's environmentally friendly, but not friendly to the insects. And so it has a few different qualities than just regular triage. Regular triage is a restricted chemical. And so um, only licensed pesticide applicators can apply it, but it also has a lot of environmental conditions that we don't, um, have in triage G4. And so we can apply it in these more environmentally sensitive areas. So with this, this is done through a trunk injection. And so we use these F-series tree IVs. So inside of here, this is a pressurized bottle that has the chemical on it, which then um, once these lines are put into trees, then we can open up the lines and then the chemical moves through the system and is injected into the tree and then moves up into the tree to protect it from emerald ash borer. And this is really important because of the way that emerald ash borer life cycle is, is that you need to get to the beetle when it's causing the damage to 
the um, tree's inner bark. And so that's why we have to kind of get those chemicals inside of there. That's why a trunk spray doesn't necessarily work and why it is more effective than a uh, traditional drenching um, because it is um, put in and it's all, all the chemicals put in immediately into those um, tissues and it's not allowed to bind with the soil. So um, these treatments are done uh, when the trees are uptaking the majority of their water for the season, so in the spring. So we are typically treating April, May, June, and um, if it's not too hot, the first couple of weeks in July. Um, you can see here, we actually did retreat this tree this past year. Um, this is a champion pumpkin ash um, in Caroline County. So it's kind of, um, it's it, you can see the bases um, are together. So this is one tree. Um, so it's pretty impressive. Um, and then in addition to that, there are other chemicals, of course, that can treat um, EAB. And one of those is imidacloprid. So imidacloprid is a neonicotinoid um, that's used as a soil drench. And unfortunately, that product is no longer available to the general public. You do need a uh, licensed, pesticide, licensed pesticide applicator to be able to um, perform treatments with imidacloprid. Uh, imidacloprid treatments are typically good for one year, whereas the um, imamectin benzoate is good for three to five years, depending on your level of EAB. So we from, a, we've got a couple of questions coming in already. Um, oh, okay. A little background on like, yeah, the trees that this, uh, the MRL dashboard kills and the sort of rate of survival and, and the impact and how important this is. And, and you just, I think you addressed one of the other questions that just came in. How often do you treat the trees? It sounds like once yeah. every like, was it three to five years, but go ahead. Yeah, so we, re we retreat trees once every three years, um, just we stay on top of it and we keep the majority of our crown. Um, once populations start to die back and um, go to really low levels, we might be able to expand it to that five years. But for us, we are on a three-year cycle for all of our treat tree treatments. And then why this, so Emerald Ash for, um, it's in the name is ash. So it attacks all fraxinous species. There's a range of um, ash susceptibility, but basically all of the ash inside of Maryland is extremely susceptible to emerald ash borer. Um, it can also attack white fringe tree. And so the thing with white fringe tree is it seems to have a better ability to, to heal the wounds over top of the larvae to be able to stop the larvae from developing completely. Now, not that it can't complete development in white fringe tree, but white fringe tree does have the ability to be able to use those defense mechanisms to build a callus over top of galleries. So, but our ash species do not have that ability. And so uh, what we do with um, our state lands is number one, we have uh, developed a treatment program for ash inside of our parks that are either um, in, endangered or um, rare species. So this would be our Carolina ash and our pumpkin ash and black ash. And so we just have very few stands of them. So we tried to treat as many of those as we could to maintain their vigor. But in addition to that, we also took ash that were inside of um, highly populated areas where they would cause hazards. So, um, and then in addition to that, then we also had wildland areas where we were able to, like I said before, those wildland areas are more rural. There's not a lot of foot traffic, but it's important to kind of keep those um, to be able to maintain ash in the landscape for the future, which is in addition to why we do treatments, but we also release parasitoids. And so we release um, three different parasitoids. So we release two larval parasitoids and an egg parasitoid. And I think we go next. Yep. So I have, um, here's one of our larval parasitoids here. And so we have been able to release um, parasitoids across the, across the state. And so the idea is, is that um, ash is going 
to be gone from our landscape in the scale that it that it has been in the past. But what we could do for the future is to try to maintain a seed bank and then maintain these um, important species such as our um, rare species to try to keep them there in the environment for the future. And then once we get to a point, so you know, with all pests, the population grows and then it crashes once it consumes all of the host species. So in this case, the ash. So when the ash go down to that 95, 99% mortality rate, then the EAB has eaten through their food. And so now then we have these parasitoids that while they're doing para their parasitoid thing where they're parasitizing EAB larvae or eggs, um, then they can then colonize what population is left and hopefully control that so that then our ash can regenerate and grow for the future. So that's kind of our hope is that in the future we won't have to treat as much um, because then these parasitoids are going to be in the environment and helping to move around. And um, we do this work, the parasitoid work, in conjunction with the University of Maryland. And so here you can see there's a whole bunch of um, people here that have been a part of this parasitoid release program. So of course, my group, Forest Pest Management, Plant Protection, also in MDA, as well as the University of Maryland Entomology Department and the Beltsville um, Invasive Insects Lab, or not Beltsville, excuse me, <laughs> um, the Beneficial Insects Lab from the USDA ARS in Newark, Delaware. And so um, we release parasitoids and then they do a lot of the follow-up work to see what parasitoids are establishing. And I don't have their research um, to present to you, but I will say that they are establishing, we are able to find these parasitoids again in, um, in these areas where we have released and in areas where we have not released uh, within five uh, miles. And then there's even been one report of parasitoids found nine kilometers away from a release site after one year. So that's uh, pretty far for, you can see, this really tiny wasp, I mean, this is a number that somebody wrote. It's not big, it's just a regular number. And so these parasitoids are very tiny. So for them to move those nine kilometers is pretty impressive. Um, and then in addition to that, I just have our map here showing that yes, Worcester County, we still have not pulled a uh, live EAB from, but we're kind of hoping to be able to do that this winter. All right, moving forward. So out of EAB land, so uh, Emerald Ash Borer is a uh, non-native to something that is native, the Southern Pine Beetle. And so Southern Pine Beetle tends to have these cyclical moves throughout um, the area. And so for us, the majority of these cycles have been found in the lower Eastern shore. So in Dorchester and Worcester counties. Um, if you remember, um, in 2014 through 2017, we had a significant mortality event in, Dorche in Lower Dorchester County, as well as along the Assateague Island uh, na na excuse me, natural areas. And so those probably saw a combined of over uh, 600 acres of uh, mortality of um, pines. So what P Southern Pine Beetle does is, um, they create these galleries. So again, these are also a bit serpentine. So you can see these here. And then off so offshoots of the galleries are these um, egg laying areas where they'll lay an egg. So here's what the egg looks like. And then through the larval stages into the pupa and then the adult. So here is an adult Southern pine beetle. Here is a grain of rice. And then here is another dendroctinus species, another um, bark boring beetle but this one is called black turpentine beetle. And so actually this one is also native and is usually typically found in the lower portion of the tree. So uh, maybe from the base of the tree to three and a half, four feet. And then Southern pine beetle is typically found in the mid bowl and higher in the tree. Um, so that's typically where we find these. And um, what happens is that Southern pine beetle has a really great pheromone that they can call 
other beetles too. And so we call it an aggregation pheromone. And when a southern pine beetle finds its golden corral, delicious, full buffet survey tree, it'll call its other beetles to it using that pheromone. And so then a lot of times what we find then is this popcorn looking um, stuff coming from the trees. So this is the tree's defense mechanism trying to push those beetles out quickly. And then um, unfortunately, when, they're, when the beetles are calling the other beetles using their aggregation pheromones, typically it's like a death of a thousand cuts. You know, the tree is trying to push them out. It's typically already weakened. Southern pine beetle loves trees that are already weakened. They kind of get that. They also can clue in to the volatiles from the tree that the tree is putting out there, saying that it's it's not doing well, it's unhealthy, and so um, they'll kind of all come to this one area attack. And then typically they can only kill weakened trees. Unfortunately, once the populations really start increasing to a really high level, then they can take out healthy trees. And so one of the other things that they bring into the equation is this fungus, this blue stain fungus. And that also decreases, um, you know, tree, the tree's ability to uptake water and nutrients. Um, one bright spot is while we trap all those trapping locations you saw, we also trap for this predatory clarid beetle. So this beetle actually goes out and consumes southern pine beetle. So you can see here is a uh, clarid with a prey. And so this is what the immature stage looks like, and this is what the adult beetle looks like. So we're looking for both southern pine beetle and these clarid beetles in um, our trapping that you saw the sites. And so we haven't seen this. This is actually a picture from that mortality event in Dorchester County. So these trees were um, on the right-hand side, the right-hand picture, these trees were weakened due to a storm event. and then the beetles were able to jump across the road and hit these healthy trees over here. So these trees were uh, healthy at the time and uh, they were killed due to that aggregation pheromone. Um, so the good news is, um, is that there is some treatments available. It's not necessarily a chemical treatment, but we can't, you can do a salvage cut to stop that, the wave of the beetles moving through. And so um, typically, if you see here, this is a, um, an old picture from one of the original Southern Pine Beetle brochures made by the Texas Forest Service. But you'll have this infested, this um, area that the beetles have killed, the area that the beetles have moved into. And so what you do is you do a cut around the infested trees to kind of make sure that um, that pheromones that are moving back and forth that are bringing the beetles to the, the trees will have been impeded by taking out this um, salvage cut of a uh, 50 to 100 foot buffer is typically what's recommended of these uninfested trees to make sure that we stop the movement of the beetle. Um, there is limited uh, chemical controls for southern pine beetle. Typically, it's something that would be used for a yard tree, it's not something that can be used in a um, forest system. And um, of course, always removal of high risk trees is a great way to stop Southern pine beetle infestations from even happening, um, such as lightning strike trees, trees that are dying um, due to saltwater intrusion or due to um, water um, flooding, um, that kind of thing. And so uh, you don't typically always have to remove the infested wood, pile and burning, or even cutting and leaving the trees usually has about a 70% effectiveness in stopping the Southern pine beetle movement. And so the good news is, is that in Maryland, in all of those um, traps that I showed earlier, none of them had any uh, level of Southern pine beetle that um, indicates that we will have a problem in this coming year. So while we did, find beetles, it's typically normal for us to find about 20 to 100 beetles in a season and for us to do surveys and to have nothing come of it. Um, the, like I said, the trees can withstand, as long as they're healthy, a um, moderate level of southern pine beetle, but this was a very low level of southern pine beetle that we caught this year. I think we had a question on this topic before you move on is Yep. Uh, Kyle Dingus mentioned uh, his understanding is that 
uh, southern pine beetle can really thrive in places that are overstocked or haven't been thinned? Is there a sort of changes in silver cultural practices or are there best practices to have thinning so you reduce the stress on the pines? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, perfect. So that's one of the um, the recommendations that the U.S. Forest Service has. They have a whole program um, for thinning and uh, make and uh, to maintain that healthy stock level for for forests and uh, as well as the New Jersey um, Forest Service has also done a lot of work showing that in um, in the stands in New Jersey once the um, stocking level has been reduced and that they're not no longer overstocked in some of their wildland areas, then the southern pine beetle pressure is, is greatly lowered. And a lot of that, you think of it is um, as trees are closer together, if they have southern pine beetles and those pheromones are going up, they'll find more southern pine beetles closer together. Whereas um, when things are sort of separated, Again, it, it'd be like somebody breathing right next to you. If you're breathing here and somebody else is breathing here, you're going to feel them. But if you guys are separated, then you might not necessarily feel that breath. And it's the same thing with the pheromones. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. So moving on. So one of the um, things that are causing damages to all of those areas that I brought up about Southern Pine Beetle is saltwater intrusion. So one of the things that we do is we do a flight every year. Uh, so we get up in a Cessna and we um, have been flying grids across the um, mid to lower shore um, where we know of areas that are being affected by saltwater intrusion. And so what we map every year is changes that we have seen from the past year. And so um, in 2021, I left these up here so you could kind of see the difference or the similarities. Um, so we saw 84,381 new acres that are being affected by saltwater intrusion. And then this past year, we mapped uh, 67,000 acres. Um, so not necessarily that this 67,000 acres is new, but all of it is new, but it is affected at a different level. And so what are the levels we're talking about is that um, if when we're up in the air and looking at it, is the damage to the affected forest very light or if it's very severe? So is the mortality only one to 3% of the trees in a given area or is it over 50% of the trees? And so as you can see, um, we've moved to basically all of our trees have been in that very severely affected category by saltwater intrusion. And so all, basically all of the stands that are mapped here on this side have over 50% of their trees being affected by saltwater intrusion. And so what are we looking at from the air? This is a picture. Uh, here's uh, the landing gear from the Cessna that we were in. And so what we're looking at here, um, so those polygons, this might be a polygon here. And you can see you know, what used to be a fully healthy forest has had March encroachment and as well as, you know, you can start to see where it's encroaching in here, as well as you can see this is still pretty uh, healthy, but then this area here is what is being affected the most. And so this is kind of the stuff that we're seeing in uh, Dorchester specifically, but in the other areas is um, patchy forest remnants that are now being affected either by saltwater intrusion or by flooding. Uh, so that's something else that we're kind of keeping an eye on, and uh, we're starting a um, partnership with some uh, universities uh, to see, um, to kind of try to quantify this um, in a more scientific manner besides just our aerial surveys. So that's kind of something that's interesting and for the future for the upcoming year. Uh, spongy moth. So um, a lot of people think of spongy moth from the 80s and 90s, but it is very much still affecting our forests. Um, here you can see a female and male spongy moth. And if you're wondering, wait, what is spongy moth? It's gypsy moth, Lymantria dispar dispar. So uh, gypsy moth is no longer the accepted common name by the uh, Entomological Society of America. So we have all moved on to spongy moth. So, and the spongy comes from these eggs. Uh, so these are all uh, large egg cases from the spongy moth. And uh, so 
basically spongy comes from when you touch them, they feel like they could, they feel full and that they'll bounce back like a sponge. Um, not my preferred, but here we are. Uh, so what does it look like when it's not a moth or a, a case? This is what they look like. Here are the beginning stages of the, the larval stages of the spongy moth before they move into the larger life, larger larval life stages where they have these blue and red dots along their um, backs. And so this is, spongy moth is the only one who has those two colors. We have several other defoliating caterpillars in some of these spongy moth areas, and they will either have white spots or they'll have long white lines along the back. They will not have these same markings. So that is one way to be able to tell Eastern tent caterpillar and forest tent caterpillar from these is that these specifically have these blue, when they're larger, they have these blue and yellow dots. And then this is what the uh, pupil cases will look like uh, when they're attached to trees. Um, and of course, this is what we're trying to prevent um, when we're dealing with spongy moth is the forest looking like December when it's actually June. So where did we find spongy moth? Uh, this year we had um, a lot of spongy moth populations in, um, so this is Salisbury here. So to the east of Salisbury from um, basically from the um, Delaware border down to Pocomoke City, which is right here. So it's Delaware to Virginia to the east of Salisbury. And so you can see there, so this year we had 6,418 acres and 48 uh, treatment blocks that qualified for suppression. Um, so, and then we only sprayed uh, 6,030 acres uh, following the withdrawals from objectors. Um, the contract winner this year was Bunting's Dustings and uh, they supplied us with this um, ag cat here. You can see this. And then these are um, the chem what our chemicals come in. So this is 4A48B that we used. This is an organic. It's um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a soil bacteria, so it only affects caterpillars. Um, and um, and so there you can see kind of our uh, specifics uh, for treatment of what we used. Um, so in generalization, spongy moss suppression is typically um, in, now is typically done either with 4A, so there's 4A, 48B, which is what we use, which is um, labeled organic with om OMRI, and uh, it's a soil bacteria. And then in addition to that, they have a 76B, which that is um, more concentrated and is sprayed at a, um, is sprayed at a third of a gallon per acre instead of a half a gallon per acre. Um, however, that is not labeled as organic, so um, we haven't used that. Um, in addition, Pennsylvania uses an insect growth regulator, Mimic. Um, it basically causes the insect to shed their skins faster. Um, and all of this is done with aerial suppression because um, we're what we're trying to do is get to the caterpillars while they're small and inside consuming material in the canopy. And so um, it's really hard, obviously, to do that with a, um, with a hose. It's a lot um, more efficient and effective when you're doing it with aerial suppression. Um, in addition, homeowners uh, for spongy moth can always do barrier bands, either whether it be with burlap or with a sticky substrate to try to prevent. The caterpillars do move up and down the trees every day. And so they'll prevent that movement and kind of stop them where they are. Um, so what does it look like for this year? So unfortunately, it doesn't look great. Um, so this year, um, this is a tree, a picture of a tree that was taken a month and a half ago in Allegheny County. And so you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six uh, female moths laying egg masses. And you can see more egg masses to uh, the north of the tree where the, um, uh, the females are. Um, in addition to that, uh, this year we saw uh, defoliation again in these areas from um, to the east of Salisbury from um, Delaware down to Virginia. Um, the good news is is that only uh, 756 acres of that defoliation that we mapped was inside of treatment blocks. And so 
uh, the majority of our treatments worked and worked very well. In addition to that, we also saw um, the spongy moth fungus and the NPV virus, which I'll show you next, um, was found in a lot of these areas on the Eastern shore. And so the good news with that is, is that um, that mortality with the mortality from our uh, spongy moth suppression hopefully has decreased the number of egg masses for this coming year. Um, however, so that's the good news. The bad news is, is that egg masses obviously have significantly increased in Western Maryland. And currently we're looking at an over 10,000 acre program inside of uh, Washington, Western Washington, Allegheny and Garrett counties. Um, and this of course goes with, um, in the summer we did male moth traps and uh, in our male moth traps trying to predict the populations for spongy moth, all of our male moth traps saw an increase of population catches by up to 50%. So um, we're expecting a larger suppression program this year, um, certainly less on the Eastern shore, but more, on, uh, more out in Western Maryland. Um, in addition to that, I will say that um, there's a couple of hot spots. Um, some of those are in Hereford, and uh, southern Baltimore counties, and in addition to Frederick County. Um, so those are kind of our hotspot areas for spongy moth. Now, the native spongy moth fungus, Entomophaga mimiga, um, that is a fungus that's in our environment. It's in the soil. When the caterpillars move down the trees, they'll come in contact with the soil. They'll pick up fungal spores. Those fungal spores will then go from inactive to active form. And then basically they consume the caterpillar from the inside out. And so then what happens is, is that they will die and then they'll come up to these sort of, um, they'll attach themselves to the tree and basically they'll just be a, a desiccated husk there. And so then the spores then are released from the body where they can come in contact with other caterpillars that are now moving up and down the tree, as well as then fall to the soil, be in the soil for the next year. And then in addition to that, something else we saw this year was a nucleopolyhedrus virus or NPV for everybody who doesn't wanna have that mouthful. So it sort of does the same thing. Um, so the caterpillars will still consume leaf material to become larger and later life stages. However, when they die, they do um, die again on the tree, and then they'll um, go into this inverted V form. So while the fungus and the virus are great, um, unfortunately, they do not stop defoliation in this, this year. However, they do stop populations from turning into moths to have them populations for the next year. So they're great at controlling things. Um, typically, the fungus is something that can control caterpillars when they're in a small amount, a small number. However, once the populations really start to explode, then the NPV virus will take a couple of seasons uh, for it to kind of expand within a population. But then usually the third or fourth year, then they'll be, it'll be able to help control populations. So I, do we have a question? Yeah, I've got some, a couple of questions. Do you guys do any control on private lands? Uh, so we do do control for spongy moth on private lands. It needs to fit into our uh, spongy moth suppression program. So there's a couple of characteristics for that. So you need to be at least 25 acres, have um, at least 50% oaks or um, trees that are extremely susceptible to spongy moth. Um, and so there's some characterization of the forest as well as you have to have a pretty dense canopy uh, we can't just have single trees here and there because of the way that we uh, spray our chemicals. If there's not a, a, a full canopy, then uh, the amount of spray that we're using isn't going to be able to control populations without that canopy to be able to keep it there and not fall to the ground. And so um, certainly if you're not in our suppression program currently, um, you can definitely reach out to me. My contact information is at the end and I'll put you in contact with your regional office. Uh, the regional offices are the ones who help uh, make those determinations for if they fit into the categories of our program. 
Boom. And there was another follow up on on cold temperatures and how long it has to be cold for to kill the eggs. How long? Uh, so um, so Canada has problems with spongy moth, so it it's just not that cold here uh, to be able to take out those um those populations. I honestly don't have a specific temperature for you. Um, but yeah, if it's not helping, if the cold isn't helping Canada, it's certainly not going to help us. So um, I can, you know, I can get you better information, but that's my, um, my non-exact number. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. All right. And so in addition to that, we don't only just look for European spongy moth the Lymantria dispar dispar. We also look for Lymantria dispar asiatica and Lyma uh, And so we do sample for eight exotic Lymantria and gender Lyma species. So these are larger moths um, that can come from the far east and um, that have the ability to move with um, transport. And so the main thing that we're concerned about in Maryland, of course, is our Chesapeake Bay corridor. Um, so there have been um, Asian spongy moth as well as rosy moth egg masses that have come into the port of Baltimore. And so these egg masses were viable. They have they had live um, eggs on them. And so typically what happens is you know, um, the USDA APHIS will come through and have a cleansing order or if they are unable to cleanse the clean cleanse and clean the ship, then they'll send the whole shipment back out. However, as most of you know, there's a lot of time that these ships um, hang out in the bay, as well as um, if you remember just last year, we had the um, ever forward, not go forward and be stuck in the bay for several months. Um, and so that definitely had a chance for those populations to move off the ship if they, if they happen to be there, which I do not, I'm not saying that they were there, I'm just saying that it was a great opportunity. And so we do these uh, exotic Asian defoliator moths um, surveys. And so in that, this past year, we're just finishing them up for this year, but in the past year, we sent off 327 adult spongy moths for analysis. And of those 321 were returned as our Lymantria dispar dispar, our European gypsy moth. And then the rest, um, the rest, the other six moths uh, were unable to be diagnosed due to test failure. Um, so that's pretty typical. Uh, so, so far, um, we have caught more uh, moths inside of our Asian. Um, it would so anyway. Sorry, nomenclature is still the same. So it's still Asian gypsy moth for the Asian species. But um, so AGM suspects have been caught, and then they've been forwarded for analysis, and we don't have the analysis back yet. Um, in addition to that, we did see a small outbreak of canker worms in Garrett County. So that um, those canker worms defoliated about 102 acres. Um, this spring. And then in addition to that, um, other, um, other events that happened this spring was a late heavy frost and snow event, and that caused um, damage. Well, it caused damage, but it, it really, what it did was it delayed the trees. Um, there's no mortality associated with this event, but the trees were significantly delayed and had some frost burn to them. And oh, Okay, there's, I'll go back to the other slide, but here's the map of the frost damage. You can see here, um, a lot of it is around a uh, Green Ridge State Forest. And so all these blue areas are areas where the frost, the late frost and snow event had impacted developing trees. So that totaled to 24,019 acres this past year. And then here's where uh, the all of our um, Asian spongy moth traps are. So you can see we have them set up in some of our rail areas and some high population uh, spongy moth areas, as well as along the uh, canal here, and then all along the shipping channel to um, the Chesapeake Bay. All right, so moving on to, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so slow. All right, so we'll try to move really quickly through these. Um, so declining oaks. Um, a lot of people have been curious about if it's oak wilt. So we've done a lot of sampling. So this is our samples from 2019 through uh, this past year, 2022. And then what did we find? So basically for oak wilt, we found them in Allegheny County only. 
um, in areas that had previously been known to have oak wilt. None of these other areas had um, oak wilt. So then you can see here is bacterial leaf scorch. So we basically found that across the state. Um, Diplodia canker, this is a bot canker. Um, the majority of these that we found were Diplodia corticola. Um, so it's something that's been found before, uh, nothing new. And so that again could be found from Allegheny through uh, the Lower Eastern Shore. And then we also sampled when we were looking for oak decline for Phytophthora species. So um, this is soil root rot. And so you can see they uh, definitely poked up throughout the state. Um, and then was there a difference between what we found in white oaks versus red oaks? And yes, there was. Um, you can see the majority of the bacterial leaf scorch we found was found in uh, red oaks. And so, um, and then basically, um, and the same thing with oak wilt, we only found oak wilt in red oaks. And again, red oaks are more susceptible to oak wilt, so that's not terribly surprising. Um, we found Phytophthora species in both red and white oaks evenly, and the bot cankers pretty evenly through red oak, red oak and white oaks. I will say that the Phytophthora species that we found was not Phytophthora remorum. It was Phytophthora cinnamoni as well as, uh, for the most part, as well as a couple of other assorted native Phytophthora species. However, we do survey for Phytophthora remorum. It used to be known as sudden oak death. Um, so we do a stream baiting survey for that in areas of high risk. And so you can see where those were across the state and all of those turned out to be negative. So this, in summary, um, we are still not sure what's causing our oak decline. However, it seems to be that there's a whole host of things out there attacking the trees. And then in addition, we also have looked at insect hosts. So not only do we have all those path um, pathogens that are affecting our trees, we also looked for uh, new oak pests. So we looked for an oak splendor beetle, oak processionary moth, and an oak ambrosia beetle. And you can see where we looked for those across the state in declining oaks. And we did not find any of these new um, insect pests. So no new insects, but a bunch of native diseases. So where does that bring us? Is that um, we still are on shore. We're thinking that it's a combination of environmental factors, the abiotic factors, um, moisture, temperature, as well as stressors from these pathogens that are causing this decline and um, mortality. So unfortunately, no smoking gun, but we are still working on this project. A lot of people would like to know about walnut twig beetle. So walnut twig beetle are these extremely tiny beetles here. Um, you can see the noggin of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so we initially found walnut twig beetle in 2013. What is bad about walnut twig beetle is that they cause a disease. They have a fungus inside of their mouth that they bring to the tree, which will cause these cankers. These cankers then coalesce and cause mortality in the trees. So this is where we had set up all of our um, walnut twig beetle traps. So walnut twig beetle has been found previously in Cecil and then in this Baltimore City, Baltimore County area as well as just on the other side of the border in Anne Arundel County. However, this year um, we did find a record in St. Mary's for the first time. Um, so this is the first time it's moved outside of this area or this area since 2018. And so that was a bit concerning. It is inside of a power station. Um, and so the trees are just outside of the power station, but it's on a power station property. So the likelihood that it actually was caused um, by introduction is pretty high. Um, so currently we just finished our walnut health surveys and currently all of the trees that even have, um, so the only place that we've seen the fungus um, consistently is in Cecil County and all of those trees look extremely healthy. Uh, we just had a report yesterday that the uh, branches that had some decline in them have basically been aborted by the tree and have fallen off. And so it's possible that mortality of walnuts in Maryland is unlikely due to the fact that these eastern walnuts are native here. And so they have a lot um, better 
a better ability to use their natural defenses to be able to fight off this infection and beetle versus trees that were out west, um, plant out of place. And so they didn't have those that ability to pull from years of adaptations. And so that's the good news um, is that we aren't seeing tree mortality and decline from this pest. However, we, as you can see, we are still surveying for it in all of our areas. Um, beach bark disease is pretty, um, it's a complex of scale, uh, nutria fungus, and uh, that causes bark damage. I'm just gonna go quickly. It um, has only been found this past year in Garrett County. And in those trees, they're declining, but they're not dying. Um, so there's a possibility for some resistance out there in the Western area. The big news is beech leaf disease. Um, so this is a disease that's associated with the nematode litolinkus. Um, it causes these the stripes, this discoloration inside of um, the leaf margins. And so it also um, can cause aborted buds. Um, typically, the young trees have been dying within a year or two of their first infection, where mature trees have been able to live with this nematode for six to 10 years. There's no uh, current approved uh, treatment for beech leaf disease. Uh, so we've been surveying for it across the state, and we've also set up permanent plots where we survey trees every year, the same trees, and take health measurements. And unfortunately, this year we have found it. Um, so you can see in the peach is where we've found beech leaf disease and we've been found a sample and we've taken it to a lab and have it confirmed. The um, Anne Arundel and Washington counties were awaiting lab confirmation. We have taken samples. Um, so unfortunately, we are positive for this disease. Since it's at the very beginning, we have not seen mortality yet, but it, should, it will be coming in the upcoming years. Um, so we're kind of hoping that they're able to come up with a treatment program soon. I'm like Willie Adelgid. I know I'm like cutting in on time, but um, so we do have a huge hemlock Willie Adelgid suppression. Um, so we use imidacloprid. It is um, either done through trunk injections, which are just like the EAB, or they're done through soil injections. Here you can see our two different soil injectors. This is a, uh, they're both liquid imidacloprid. Um, this is an injectable imidacloprid, and this is a soil. Um, so we use liquid imidacloprid 2F. Those are the two names, Curates and Easy Eject Light of what we use. And in addition to that, we've also used Cortec tablets um, for uh, small trees. Um, we do only treat hemlocks that are within 50 feet of water with the trunk injection. So that way that we know that that chemical is getting into those trees and not into the environment. So in total, uh, since 2004, we have treated uh, 1,339,998 inches of DBH, and that is uh, a savings of 124,891 hemlocks. So it's pretty um, impressive for our small crew. This past year, we treated um, 20,735 uh, trees for a uh, total inches of DBH, you can see here is 232,000. So that's just what we treated in this past year. And you can see this map up here. Um, the majority of our stand, our hem heavy hemlock stands are here, but we do have uh, stands across the state that we treat. Um, we also released beetles. These are predatory beetles, Laracobius nigrenus and Laracobius osakensis. So you can see this beetle right here. This is what we're talking about. This beetle will come and consume HWA. And so in total this past year, we released 4,320 predators. Um, so here is a, a kernel density map. And uh, you can see uh, where the hotspots are, where we, we have released the most beetles. Um, so here you can see our Western region, our central region and our Northeast region. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have released other um, types of predators of HWA. They haven't been as successful, but we have released them in the past. Um, but the most successful is this Laracobius nigrenus, which is why we have continued to release it in large numbers. And so you can see there in total, our program has released um, a little over 40, 34,000 of these LNs. 
So where have we, we've released them? Have we recovered them? Yes, we have. You can see here uh, the majority, a lot of our larger recoveries have been in our um, Frederick and our central region, but we've also had real fairly large recoveries in and around Cumberland. And we also have had some smaller recoveries um, in our Northeast area. So overall, a very successful program. We've also done hemlock restoration. So in areas that have seen a lot of their hemlocks um, disappear, we have been able to work with the um, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's nursery uh, to raise hemlock trees. And so um, you can see here at Cunningham State Falls Park, these each triangle is for a single tree. So it's, um, it's really, really a pretty cool program to get hemlocks back in the landscape. Cyrex wood wasp, we do survey for this. It has not been found. You can see here across the state, um, we have not found it at all, but we have found some um, natives. And so these are the two natives that we have found, um, but we have not found any Cyrex noctilio. It is a wood wasp that affects pine trees specifically. And it has been found in New York and Pennsylvania and Maine, but not here, which is great. It seems to be extremely slow moving. Uh, so without uh, human assistance, I'm hopeful that we won't find this in our state. In addition, we also have been looking for a red bay ambrosia beetle. This is a beetle that brings with it the laurel wilt fungus. So it attacks sassafras, um, bay laurels, red bays, um, and uh, has caused mortality in a lot of the south. Uh, however, we have not seen that here, which is great. Um, and then finally, um, some additional pests we do track for I have, oh, beach bark disease, forest tent caterpillar, eastern tent caterpillar, those we look for, like I said, inside of our defoliation areas. Uh, we also do a ton of other small hosts. Um, so you can see in Washington County, we had some walking stick um, infestation in Allegheny this past year. We had cherry scallop shell moth, basically anything that's affecting forests we're trying to map. And then finally, Dorchester County, we saw a hail event uh, in 2022. So that affected some acreage as well as um, here's our saltwater intrusion. And then one of the other things is a lunged hemlock scale. And so of course we've seen that um, kind of across our upper tier of counties. So if you're ever stuck in the mud, like I have been, um, we're definitely here to help and assist when we can. Um, we are only 10 employees across the state, so sometimes it does take us some time, but here is my um, email and phone number, and I'm happy to assist. Thank you, Heather. Yep. I learned a lot about entomology in that session and um, was popping in like links to some of these species as you were as you were going through, so to help other people. We're getting some comments coming in. We have a few uh, questions that I didn't put out yet. Um, I'm going to try to, um, everybody, uh, uh, feel free to add questions into the chat. I'm going to try and run through a few of them right now. Um, uh, so when you were talking about the ash borer, uh, somebody, Brenda Beal, a uh, great volunteer in our Delmarva Woodland Stewards Program, she's just an awesome person. She uh, asked, you know, is this, is this our chest, are ash trees going the way of the chestnut? Are they is this a sustainable thing? Are they really just kind of like on life support at this point? And um, could you describe sort of the long-term thoughts about what's happening with ash trees? They're all dead in my back area. They're, they're none left. So I'm curious, to, are, they, are we looking at functional extinction here? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, pretty much. I think, you know, with with the work that a lot of us scientists are doing, we're also looking for a lingering ash. So there do seem to be ash that are inside of our susceptible varieties that have been able to kind of go the way of the um, white fringe tree and have some adaptations. And so currently um, there's researchers with, AR, with a USDA um, Agricultural Research Service that have been able to identify um, of the ability of these trees to be able to resist EAB. And so um, they're trialing those now, but, you know, for us here, certainly we're going to see, you know, 99% of our ash um, that haven't been treated to um, perish from this beetle. And so 
the ways to bring it back are, um, or and to keep it here, or to keep the seed bank through treatments um, until we have enough parasitoids that have built up within the population to be able to control those beetles. Um, I do not expect us to get to where we to get to the you know square footage that we have seen in the past, but it certainly can be in our landscape in a much smaller quantity. Yeah. I did see some early research on that. That's at least some some hope out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, David Peterson asked him, you know, I, I remember learning, uh, looking into the various things that could be causing oak declines. And it's like oaks have so many things that go after them. Uh, I remember just being like, wow, there's a presentation with like 15 different insects that attack oaks. Um, but he, so I, I'm sure this is gonna be a very hard question to answer, but David asks, what's the sort of level of risk by the various, does it, various pests you mentioned in your presentation. I think you had some some bar charts on the red oaks and the white oaks. Do those, those correspond to the level of kind of risk that you feel, or are there some other like hot ones that you think people should be aware of? Yeah, so I think um, so for level of risk, I feel like for the red oaks is uh, bacterial leaf scorch is seems to be um, the, the one that we find more often than not. And then, um, it seemed, we thought that the diplodia or the bot cankers were going to be a bigger problem because there was a new diplodia that was discovered in some of our samples. Um, however, it hasn't shown up again since. And uh, so it was found, diplodia porcivorous was found and described in 2018, and we haven't been able to find it in our samples since then. Um, so that I think is, I feel like has kind of like come back. Again, all of these things were characterized as secondary pests, something that, you know, could harm or be around when there's something else already affecting the trees. And so I don't think we've really been able to quantify in this kind of new world how much those are going to actually affect our trees when before they weren't affecting them as much or, a tree, or these trees were healthy and able to withstand these infections. Um, or, you know, even beetle presence, certainly there's a, a lot of um, different types of agrilis that could affect our um, agrilis or, um, you know, flat-headed, round-headed borers that attack oaks and um, that the trees could easily withstand kind of like what I was talking with southern pine beetle, but it just seems like now they're not able to. And so I don't really think we have a good handle on or even if there's any research currently on those old secondary pests, if they're going to be causing larger future issues. And so um, unfortunately, I don't think I really have a good like number system for you for that, um, just that what we are seeing, which is that these secondary pests are affecting the trees or um, that they're um, in trees that are in major decline, we're able to find them. But in addition to that, I will say Amalaria root rot seems to be um, causing a lot of problems. And that's one that we haven't really been doing a lot of survey for because it seems to be in a lot of our um, declining trees. And so definitely Missouri has seen a lot of it. And so it could that could be another one I think that I didn't mention that could also be affecting our forests. Right. Um... Thanks. Yeah, I've actually noticed like sometimes just minor damage to the bark. And I, I was as I was looking up the dip, diploidia or the yeah, diploidia. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like also it's like it can maybe be living on the bark harmlessly for a long time. But if there's a damage or some sort of scar, it can infiltrate into it, cause trouble. And I've seen that with the, a neighbor had a, a gash in the base of a tree from some construction equipment. Wasn't didn't seem that bad. Right. But that whole tree yeah. is a nice big majestic oak so be careful to bark on your oaks you know if, if you're doing any construction work or anything else like those wounds can lead to uh, things getting into them so uh great uh let me see i we had one question about asian longhorn beetles are those around here so no we don't have those <laughs> isn't that great, great. um so asian longhorn beetle is a um is, a, is an asian um it's a beetle of Asian uh, descent, and um, it's currently in um, South Carolina in uh, breeding populations, and it has been found in uh, Massachusetts, Ohio, um, and, so, and New York. 
And so New York has been declared eradicated. And so the good news is, is with Asian longhorn beetle, as long as you can get into a population when it's still initially um, establishing, uh, eradication works very well. And so if it, the USDA Animal Plant Health Inspection Service has been able to eradicate several populations, it's not pretty. Uh, Asian longhorn beetle has a very large host range. And so a lot of trees have to be so, um, sort of cut down for the cause. However, they are able to get those populations um, extinguished with removals and trapping. And so um, we are going to be surveying for Asian longhorn beetle in the next year in 2024. We've just started um, the process for uh, for looking at those. Trapping is not great. And so we won't be doing trapping. We'll do, be doing visual surveys. And so this is mainly in maples uh, that we're looking at. Um, they are the preferred tree of Asian longhorn beetle, even though it does have that extremely long host range list. So we will mostly be surveying for maples and looking for signs of Asian longhorn beetle. It is very cryptic, even though it is very large. Um, they typically are in the upper parts of the trees first. Um, but like I said, the good news is, is that we don't have it um, and that um, if we ever find it in the future, I am really hopeful for its eventual eradication. Cool. Uh, there was another final question. If anybody has anything else, please top, pop it in. Last couple, last call here. And thank you, Heather, for staying on a little bit long and mm -hmm. for all the who are staying on past the one o'clock hour. Um, but we did have somebody ask, oh, how many parasitoids are, are you releasing? Are they self-sustaining populations or is this the kind of thing we'll have to continually uh, put out new parasitoids? Um, so currently we're releasing um, about 800 of the egg parasitoid, the Oobius, per site. Um, so you saw we had um, six sites for Oobius this year. And so, you know, six times 800, that's how many of the egg parasitoid released. And then as far as the larval parasitoids, right now we only have one site approved for those. And so that's um, about 5,000 um, parasitoids released this year. And so the we do releases for two years of these, um, same amounts of numbers each time. And um, basically they are, they do seem to be self-sustaining at this point. Um, we, those um, recoveries that I talked about um, have been continuing on. And so a lot of those are being done in places where we haven't currently been releasing. So we're not catching what we've released. We're catching what's been there from previous years. Um, so yeah, so it's not, um, they are self-sustaining um, where we go from, from here um, as how far out um, is really up to the researchers. All right. And I know there is a long process for uh, reintroducing those parasitoids and like making sure that they don't cause more problems. So if anybody's here listening, thinking, well, might we cause more problems by bringing in natural predators? There's a long process of, of testing to make sure that they're not going to cause additional problems, right? Yep. Yeah, there's a whole federal process for that. And if you're ever interested, there's um, a couple hundred pages worth of um, finding of no sig significant impacts. That was part of an environmental assessment done for each parasitoid. Um, so if you're ever interested, all you have to do is Google um, F-O-N-S-I or E-A, which is, stands for Environmental Assessment of um, Emerald Ash Borer Parasitoids, and you will find it on Google. I bet, I bet. Well, Heather, thank you. That's all. We've got a lot of thank yous coming in. Um, it was a great audience. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you learned something. Um, look forward to seeing you next month where Bob Long is going to be talking about wild turkeys. We'll be moving back to the vertebrates and game species. So um, we've got some applauses. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we will see you all next month. Thank you, Heather. Yep. Thank you.